Hi, and welcome to another Rails screencast for our e-commerce course. Today we're going to build a very simple e-commerce store using Rails, and we're going to start out by using scaffolding. And so what we want to do is we want to um, create a model and associated uh, controller and view code for a products table. So our database table will be products means we will create a model called product and this model will be sort of a very simplified product model the model will have a name it will have a um, description and a price so a very simple type of product uh, the name is going to be a string the description will be text and the price will be a decimal value. And so we'll start off with um, that. We'll create a new Rails project to begin with. So I will open up a command window and I will have um, Rails generate a new project for me. Rails new my store. And for this screencast, I'm not going to be saving my code to GitHub. I may, at the end of the screencast, create a repository um, sort of after I'm done the screencast and push all the code there. But I won't be going back and forth to GitHub during my development today. Okay, so Rails has created my whole structure for me for my application. Bundle's just running to make sure all the gems are installed. And we can see that I have a new folder called my store. And what I can do is I can open up a second command prompt window into that folder. One of the command prompt windows, um, I'm going to sort of go into my new store folder and run the server. And then that window will just remain the server window from this point out. Once the server starts out, I can just make sure I get my Rails startup message and then I will go delete the file associated with that welcome message. So my server is running. I know that it is because it tells me that uh, the server has started and which port it started on. And so I can go to HTTP localhost colon 3000 and I should see my startup message or the welcome message. And so after that, I'm going to go to my public folder and I'm going to remove the index.html in there. And if I go back to the browser, we now get a routing error because we don't have any route set for the root of our project. So from my command prompt, I'm now going to generate the scaffold for a product model and all the rest of the associated code. For your individual e-commerce, uh, projects, you likely won't want to use scaffolding. You'll want to just create models uh, for all of the the tables that you need for your project. So you'll likely have a, uh, a product model and a customer model and maybe um, a line items model and an orders model, those kind of models. And then you can use a gem like Active Admin to build you all of the CRUD tasks for your backend uh, admin dashboard. And so I'm not going to use active admin for this project, so I will use scaffolding. So I'll go and say Rails generate scaffold for a product where a product is going to have a name, colon string, and a description, colon text. Again, remember the difference between those is that string will end up being a varchar limited to 255 characters in the database, whereas uh, text will be a text blob, which will don't, they won't have a, a length restriction on it. And lastly, a price, which is decimal. And so that will generate for me um, a model in the app models folder called product.rb. I'll get a controller in my controllers folder called products controller, and I'll get a number of views in the app views products folder. And so 
To begin with, I might want to open up some of those files. So the app models product model, I'll open that up. And at this point, it might be nice to add some validations to my various attributes. So I might say validates the uh, description, the name, and the price such that the presence of each of those must be true. And we can also say uh, validates the price such that numericality is true. Now I could go into sort of much more finer grain detail on the numericality. I could set it to be, um, you know, a number which had to be greater than one cent. But just to keep things simple, these are the two validations I will put on my product model. Now, when we do scaffolding, we have created a migration for our database. So a description of what the database changes need to look like to enable uh, us to have a products table, but we don't yet have that products table. If I was to look at the migration file, it looks like this. It's a class that it inherits from active record migration. It has a single method in it called change that describes the change that we're about to make to the database. And here is the statement within it saying that we are creating a table called products and the description of that table. Uh, these are the things that we had entered in from the command prompt, a name, string, field, a description, text, and price decimal. And then Rails always adds in the created at and updated at timestamps and of course a primary key called ID. And so we need to run this migration and we do so by typing rake db migrate. If we were now to look in our config folder, we could see our routing file, routes.rb. And we can see that we have this one line in here, resources, products. And in the past, when we were creating sort of non-scaffolded controllers, we were manually matching all of the URLs to their associated controller actions. This one command here, generates all the CRUD routes or the RESTful CRUD routes that Rails needs to allow us to interact with our products database. And if we wanted to see all the routes that were generated by this one line, we could go back to rake and say rake routes. And this will inspect the routes that exist in our product, or sorry, in our project. And we'll see sort of the names of the routes, the HTTP verbs they respond to, the URLs that will trigger them, and the controllers and actions that they will uh, end up running. So the names are in the first column, the HTTP verbs in the next one, these are the associated URLs, and finally in the last column is which controller and which action is called for each one of those routes. So if I want to see the index of all of my products, well, then I just need to do a get request to slash products. So I can go back to my browser and do that. And here is my scaffolded CRUD, so I can create a new product. If I just try to create an empty one, the validations that I've put in will trigger. You can see that there's four validation errors. I can put um, put in a new product here. I can say uh, an old bananas. Old bananas, we're selling those. These bananas are old and brown, but perfect for banana bread. Okay, and so the price of these old bananas will be 34 cents, and I'll create my product. So the product was created successfully. I can see all the things that I entered for it. If I go back, I'm at my products listing. We can sort of think of this uh, 
scaffolded products listing and the associated new and edit capabilities as being our backend dashboard since we're not using active admin for this project. And so I'll create a few more uh, products at this point. So we've got old bananas. Have some ruby shoes. And the price, these are expensive shoes. And I'll add in one more new product here, which is a, a used t-shirt. Uh, one used t-shirt. Still in pretty good condition. Smells of it. All right. And a used t-shirt is 450. So I've got enough products to, uh, to work with for now. If this scaffolded part of my application is sort of taking the place of my admin backend, then I'm going to also want a front end for the users of my store to be able to list my products, uh, view them, see their description, see their price, that kind of thing. I want to keep my backend uh, separate from what the end user sees when they visit my store. So next up, I, what I want to do is I'm going to create a non-scaffolded controller uh, just called store. And to start with, uh, store is going to have an index action and it, where sort of all products will be listed. And there'll also be a show action uh, to list individual products. All right, so let's get to work on that. Um, one of the things I'm going to do with these, the views associated with these two actions is we're gonna look at some of the repetition that might exist when we list all products and when we list a single product. And we're going to create a partial that will be uh, a view representation of what a product, at least what the markup of a product should look like. And we can then use that same partial when we list all products or when we list a single product so that we don't have to have that markup repeated in both the index view and the show view. So let's start by generating the controller. Rails generate controller store. And since I know that I need these two actions, I can list them here. I can say index and show. So that's what I wanted. And we can run that. That will give me a new controller in my controllers folder, which I will open up. And you'll see also that my browser has detected that the routing file has changed. So I'll, I'll uh, load that up as well. So in the routing file, when I generated that controller, Rails added these two routes for me. I'm actually going to remove them and we'll manually create the routes that we need. And then here's my store controller. And in my app views store folder, I have an index and a show that I can open up here. So as far as the routing file goes, I'd like the root for my domain to be the store controller's index action. So when the users come to my domain without any path associated with it, they'll get the index action and they'll see a list of all of my products. And so I could do something like this. I could say, map, oh no, I'll use the, the root. I'll say root uh, to the store controller's index action. And I'll set that up so that it only responds to HTTP get requests. And I'm also going to create a route for 
the show where I show an individual product. And so I'll say match and we'll have an individual product. We'll have the associated URL at least for the individual product to, to be store slash some ID where the ID is the, the primary key of the product that you wish to display. And here I can have that point to the store controllers show action. And I can say that I can give it a name and call it a store product. And again, I'll restrict that to an HTTP get request. If we were to return to my command prompt here, I could again run rake routes and I would see those new routes showing up in the uh, in the listing in the output here. And there they are, there's my root. You can see it's going to the index action of the store controller and there's the one called store product which is going to the show action of the store controller and it has the, um, the ID as part of the route. Because those routes are set up, I should now be able to uh, access both of those controller actions. They currently don't do anything, but I would be able to then see this text, this default text that's inside of both of the views. So for the index, I should see it saying uh, in an H1 store index and where the file's located and for show as well. So if I go to the root, see my index and if I was to go to slash store slash some ID I see the show view so as far as the controllers go I need to make some data available to each of those views and to do so I create instance variables in the actions and those instance variables are shared with the associated views. So we know that after the index action is uh, run, we will sort of automatically load the app views store index.html.erb and it'll have access to all of the index uh, instance variables that the index action created and the show has an associated view show.html.erb. For the index, I want to show all of the, uh, the products that are in my store. So I might do something like products equals, and then I go to my product model. I could do all, or I could do maybe sort of order by name. So I get like an alphabetical listing of the products in my store. For show, I'm going to show an individual product and I'm going to find that by way of the product model. The find method lets me find by ID. And the ID is coming to me by way of my route. So again, if we look at the route, we can see that I have this ID placeholder in the URL. And that's going to end up inside of the Rails params hash. So I can say params at position ID. So whenever we post data to Rails, either by way of URLs in GET requests or by way of forms, by way of post requests, that data ends up in the params hash. So here I'm getting the ID. I now need to implement these views. And so in the index, I might say um, something like uh, my store and then here might be a good idea now to loop through all of my products. So I'll say at products because I have access now to that at products variable because I made it an instance variable inside of the index action. I can say dot each. And I don't want um, that. each do. Call each product product. At an end for my block. And then here 
I'm going to describe the markup of sort of how a product should be displayed. I'm going to pull out certain bits of data from my product. So I might, um, inside of an H2, display the product name. And you know, maybe all of this is happening inside of some sort of section tag. And then the product description, well, maybe I have that inside of a div with a class of description for future styling purposes. And I can echo in the product description now. And then maybe here I do a paragraph tag with a class of uh, price where I then echo in the um, product price. I'll add a few classes here. And maybe, yeah, that's, that's all I really need for now. I won't get any fancier. I'm not actually going to make use of these classes uh, in this screencast anyways, but there you go. I've added some just for future proofing. I should now be able to actually go to the root of my application and see. Oh, I've gone to the wrong place. I need to go to the root. And here's an alphabetical listing of the products in my store. Old bananas, a description, and a price. Ruby shoes, description, price, etc. Not bad. Now I might like for each of the titles to link to an individual page for displaying sort of, you know, just that product alone. And that'll be the show page. And so I might want to use the route that I set up here, which has this placeholder ID to link to the show page for each of the products. And so I want that to be on the H2. So instead of just using the product name for the, the H2, I'll use a link to command. The first attribute being the link text and the second attribute being what I actually wish to link to. Now the long form here would be the fact that I wanted to link to, uh, I named my route store product. So I'll say store product path, because I always add underscore path to these arguments. And then which particular product? Well, the product's called product. Reload. I have links for each one of these now. I click through. And no errors, but nothing was displayed because I haven't yet updated my show view. What likely happened though is you can see here the primary key of that particular product was displayed. If I go to a different product, its primary key is displayed as part of the URL. The store controller in the show action, that ID is, is being used to find a product and then I have access to a product object. So at this point, we might be tempted to do something like this, to grab the code that exists inside of this loop because this is displaying a single product uh, inside of the loop and to paste it into the show view here. and then to remove the, the sort of the default text. I don't have a variable called product alone. Remember in my controller, I've made a uh, reference to an at product. So I would have to now make some slight modifications here. So 
save. Reload this. Okay, look at that. So I've I've got my individual pages set up. I might like some way to return back to um, the main page. So below the display of the product, I might have a paragraph tag, which includes a link to where I say link to home, which is the root path. Reload that page. And I've got a home button or home link takes me back home. So everything's working fine to a point, uh, but I have some repetition in my view. My view is not dry, as in don't repeat yourself. Um, I have two places in my views that uh, sort of represent the markup for a product. I have this representation of what a product's markup looks like, and I have nearly identical this representation. And so if I wanted to make a change to how my product's displayed, I'd have to change it in two places. So for example, right now, the price uh, is being displayed. I would like a dollar sign in front of all my prices, and I'd also like the numbers to be padded with zero. So instead of displaying four, 0.5, it would be nice for it to be 4.50 or 450. And so there's a uh, there's actually a Rails helper for that uh, that will take in a number and produce a, um, a sort of currency representation. Sometimes when we want to figure out how to do things with Rails, we go to the Rails guides, right? We go to our version of the Rails guides and we look things up. Another option is to use the API. Uh, so api.rubyonrails.org and because we are not using Rails 4 we have to add the version after that so you may want to bookmark this particular site and so what we have here is API docs for Rails and we have an autocomplete search here and I have a memory of a helper that I could use to format prices and I know it started with the word number so I can say number two and I can see that there's some different helpers that deal with converting numbers to different things one of them's number to currency which is a really interesting number uh, sorry a really interesting helper there's other ones here number to human is pretty neat it will take um, numbers like this right here and turn them into sort of a more readable form so instead of one two zero 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 rails would display 1.2 billion we want the currency helper though which will take in a number and format it as a currency there's a bunch of different options that we can set uh, for that but we just want the default so for my price here i'd have to make this change once number to currency and twice number two currency and so that's the uh, the hazard of having code which isn't dry when you need to make modifications you now need to make modifications in multiple places and you need to keep in mind or, or have in memory all the different places where those modifications have to be made and so we can look at the effects of my change here There's, now it says 450. If I click in on that link, it also says 450. But there's got to be a better way. And the better way is to use partials. To have um, one partial, and a partial you can think of as being almost like a method for view code. Uh, you could have a partial be a representation of what it is to be a product, and we could use that partial both for the index and the show. And so in a previous lecture, we looked at partials in terms of uh, removing repetition from a displayed form. And so we had a, and this will be the same as what exists inside of our scaffolded view. We had um, the idea that both the new and the edit views both displayed a form. 
And what we did is we created a form partial to remove that repetition so that both the edit and the new simply had a call to render out a form. And then the form partial itself contained what would have been repeated across those two different views. What we want to do today is a little bit different. We want to associate a partial with a particular active record model. And so we want to say, you know, this particular partial is for a product object. So we're going to create the, uh, even though we're working with the store views right now, we're going to create the partial in the products folder. And we're going to name this underscore product.html.erb. Naming is very important in Rails, and so the name of this partial is very important. And so we are creating uh, a partial that will be linked to a product model object, and so we name it product. Also by naming it product, when we render this partial, we're going to pass it an object of type product. So in the show view, for example, instead of having all of this code, we're simply going to have a statement which says render our product like that. And what will then happen is the render statement will see that this is an active record object of type product. It will look in the products views folder for a product html.erb and then it will convert the parameter that we've passed it to a variable simply called product without the at symbol. Uh, this is important because in the context of how we want to use this partial, we won't always have an at product variable. If we look at the index, when, we when we're eventually going to want to render out a uh, partial for each of these products, we may only have a product variable. And so I'm going to copy and paste or cut and paste this code here into my product partial. And I can leave it as it stands because here it references a product variable, which is what Rails will make available to me. So I can now look at my show view and it should now render out the product and display this partial. So if we go back to my store, click on any one of my links, There's the product represented using the product partial. For the index, we might think that the best thing to do would be to do this, to for each of our sort of products in this loop, we're looping over this products collection. We might say render product. And that's okay, it'll work, right? If I go to my homepage, it will indeed render that partial once for each of the objects in my collection. But Rails, the, uh, the render command for Rails is actually a little smarter than that. And so I can simply say render products. Remembering that I have a products variable um, available to me in the index action and a product variable available to me in the show. So in the index, I say render products. In the show, I say render product. And what'll happen in this case is Rails will see that this isn't just a single active record object, like in the case of show, but a collection of objects. And so it will repeatedly render the associated partial once for each member in that collection. And so if I go back to my store and back to the root, we get the same thing. But our views are incredibly dry now. So the index view simply looks like this, show view looks like this. And anytime we want to make a modification to the markup associated with a product, we have one and only one place where we can make that change. And so if I wanted the price to be displayed directly below the product name, well, I could simply 
move that, save my partial, and now throughout my website, not only on the home page, will we see a change of the position of the price, but we'll also see it on the individual product pages. Okay, so that's what I wanted to accomplish as far as partials go. I have a little bit more that I want to do here as far as this project goes. And so I've described that a product should have a name, a description, and a price. But now I've gotten to the point in my store where perhaps I want to start categorizing my products. And so I want a database table called categories with an associated model called uh, category. And a category will simply have a name and a description. But I want these two things to be linked together. I want uh, one to many association between products and categories where a product can belong to a single category and a category will have many products. And so since the relationship is that a product will belong to a single category, then I can put a foreign key on my products table. And this will be a foreign key that is going to allow me to associate products with categories. Again, naming conventions are very important. I name my foreign key after the model that I wish to be uh, associating with, and then followed by underscore ID. So since my model is category, in all lowercase here, I have category underscore ID, and it's a type integer. Now, our products table already exists, and it doesn't have a category ID in it. So what I need to use now is a migration, a way of uh, describing to Rails the changes I want to make to my database. We originally used a migration to create our products table, and this was generated for us by way of scaffolding. After I scaffold up a category, I'm going to use a migration to modify my products table. So let's first scaffold up category. So let's say Rails generate scaffold category, where a category has a name string and a description text. And after I run that scaffold command, I'll run rake db migrate to create the categories table. Notice that Rails is uh, somewhat aware of special cases for pluralization. So when I called my scaffold category, I got created for me a categories controller and a view folder called categories as well. And the database table was also called categories. I can get to my categories by way of the scaffolded categories path. And I can create a, a few categories to work with. So I might have a category for food, delicious food stuff. And I might have a category for clothing. So I'll create one for that. Cover your body with this stuff. And then we might have a third category, which right now I'll just call um, computer equipment. Okay. I have 
three categories now. I need my foreign key to exist. I need to make a change to my database table structure. And I can do this in two ways. If we were to look at the Rails guide, there's a whole guide on migrations, Rails database migrations. And it explains sort of how to create migrations that are sort of empty migrations to begin with. And we write the code within them to describe uh, the changes that need to be made to a particular table. So there's a section here for creating tables, changing tables, etc. There's also some sort of handy defaults. And so we're going to use one of these handy defaults. It's very common in a web project to be adding columns to a table. And so there's a handy default, which we can use like this, we say rails generate for me a migration. And then the name of this migration is very important. We're going to say add underscore, and then the thing we wish to add, which is a category ID, category underscore ID. This was this foreign key right here. And we want to add it to the products table. And so we can write our migration in the form add x to y, where x is the column name and y is the table name. And then we simply have to explain what that column is. So I can say the category ID column is an integer. I think there's even a way of specifying that's a foreign key, but we'll just keep things simple as saying it's an integer and we'll use it as a foreign key. So we'll run that and there'll be a new migration file that will show up in my database folder. Here it is. It is a class that inherits from active record migration, includes a single change method with a statement in it. So we could have just said Rails generate migration and the name of the migration, and we could have written this statement ourselves: add column, name of table, name of column, type. But Rails did that for us. All we need to do is run the migration with rakedb migrate. It should also be mentioned at this point that we can also use rake to sort of undo migrations uh, to step back sort of in time as far as what our database looked at like at specific times. And so if I wanted to revert back to a time when I only had the products table in existence, I would go to um, the migration folder. And at the front of every migration is a date timestamp. And if I capture that just by copying it, I could run something like rake db migrate, specifying that the version is, and then I could paste in that number. And this would sort of undo all of the migrations up to, but not including the migration that I got the date timestamp from. So this would take me back in time to, um, to when I only had a products table. So sometimes it can be helpful to do that if you make a mistake with uh, a migration. At this point, though, I should now have a category ID column, which is an integer on my products table. That's great. I'm going to then open up both my models. My product model and my category model. And I'm going to associate them with each other in a sort of declarative way within the model classes. A product is the particular class, or sorry, the particular um, active record object that has the foreign key on it. So it belongs to a category. So I say belongs to category. And I specify category singular because I only have a single category ID. And so I can only ever be associated with a single category. So a product belongs to a category. Whereas a category, uh, because it's sort of the, it's what's being pointed to by the foreign key, a category has many products, plural, has many products. The other change I need to make is I've added a new column 
to my database table. And I'm eventually going to want to make that column um, editable from the sort of the web uh, scaffolding that we have made earlier. And so I need to whitelist that column name. At the top of my product model, I have this adder accessible, which lists the three original column names. And I need to add to it the fact that I want from the web uh, the category ID also to be accessible. Save that. On the surface, my application won't look or feel any different. If I go to create a new product, Rails was not sort of clever enough to go and modify my product form to include a place for the category ID, but I can make that modification. I know that that product form is a partial that exists uh, in my views folder, my products views folder. And so I'll go and open up that particular partial. So in the products, I have this form partial. And here you can see in the form partial, Rails is using form four, a product and making accessible to us this F variable, which is a form builder. And then within here, we're using that form builder to make labels and text fields and text areas and a place for our price. I can copy and paste the price one here, this whole div, div class field, which has a label and a text field inside of it. And I can then I make a minor modification here so that the label is now for the category ID and the text field is now for the category ID. And I can also make an, a, a modification to my product partial so that with any given product I can display the category this product belongs to. So in a paragraph tag, I can say category. And because I set up my associations in my model, because I set up my belongs to and has many associations, here I can say that I want to display the products category category name. The process of associating a product in the category will be a little awkward right now, and we'll make, we'll make some changes to that next. If I reload this new product form, we'll see that the, uh, the changes we made to the form partial have added this category area down below. And if we were to edit an existing product, we'd see that as well. Um, maybe that's what I'll do. I'll go back to my existing products here. And I'll say, okay, bananas, let's edit that. And now here I could sort of manually put in a foreign key. And which foreign key? Well, I can open up another look at my web app here. And if I edit, say, food, for example, I can see that it is, it has a primary key of one. And so I could add a foreign key of one to old bananas because old bananas are food. I can update my product. And now when I go back to my root, I would see an error. That's because not every product has a category. And so I could sort of put a guard up here saying, you know, uh, if the product we're dealing with has a category. Then display it. Otherwise, don't. And this relies on the fact that if there is no associated category, then product.category will be nil, which will evaluate to false.
So there's my category of food. I could then go back to my store, to my products, and I could you know, make those same modifications to the other products, sort of manually associating by way of foreign keys. But that's not the best way to do it, especially if we want sort of regular non-programmer users to be making use of our backend. We don't want to have to tell them, um, you know, explain what foreign keys are, tell them this process where they have to go to the categories section, find primary keys, plug them into the product section. It would be nice if when we edit or create a new product, there would simply be a drop down menu of the available categories. And so that's the last thing we're going to work at implementing today. I'm going to close down some of what's up here because I no longer need to work with these. I'll keep this as the form partial for products. We'll be making modifications with it. I'm also going to open up the scaffolded products controller. And what I need to do is for both the new and the edit, I need to make available an instance variable, which is a list of all of my categories. So I'll say categories equals category.all, or I could maybe order them alphabetically by name. And I could paste them in here. At this point, you might say to yourself, well, this isn't very dry. You've got some repetition here on gathering categories. In an upcoming lecture, we'll look at something called filters, which will allow me to remove this repetition and declaratively at the top of the controller, uh, explain to Rails that I want to load up categories in both the new and the edit action. And then I won't have this line repeated. But for now, our code is slightly undry by way of this repetition. But now, um, anytime we load up this form partial on the new or the edit page, we'll have access to categories. And on the form itself, currently we're creating a text field for the category. Instead, we're going to use a form builder called collection select, where the first argument is the column we're working with or the property of the active record object we're working with. Next up is where to find the potential categories. And that's the categories collection that we gathered up in both the edit and the new. And then what this is going to build for us HTML wise is going to be a selection tag that has a number of option tags inside of it. And if you think back to your web dev course, you'll remember that uh, selection tags, the options inside of them, you can have text that is inside of the, um, the option tag itself. And then there's a value attribute that you can set um, for each of the options. And that's what's actually will be submitted when you select an individual option. And so this next parameter here is going to be what you want, uh, sort of which property on an individual category do you want to use for that value on the option tag? And we want to use the ID because that's the primary key of the category, which we wish to set as the foreign key on this product. And then the actual display text of so what the user sees when they are working with this dropdown, well, we want it to be the category name. And so that's the, uh, those are the arguments for collection select. This is the property of a product we're working with right now. This is the collection of category objects we're working with right now. This is the, the value attribute of the option tags that will be created. So a category ID will be used for each one of those. And then this is the actual text that will be used with the option tag. And I'll go view source when we go um, and look at this form so that we can see um, how this has been done. So here is my product that I'm editing. When I reload it, you'll see that category now indeed has a dropdown. There are my different categories. 
I can say, okay, Ruby Shoes is clothing. I can update it. Go back. If I was to make a new product, like a uh, one terabyte SSD hard drive, This is a large and fast hard drive. The price, hard drives are incredibly cheap these days. This is $1.25. And you can again see that my category has a drop down, and I can pick computer equipment. If I view source here for a moment, we can see what Rails has built for us by way of that collection select. And that's this right here. It's built for us a select tag which extends all the way down to this slash select and inside of it it's put in three option tags one for each option in my drop down it's used the name of each category as the content of each option tag and it's used the primary key or the id of each category as the value of each option tag. So when we select a particular option, what will be submitted as part of our form will be the primary keys of the category we wish to associate with, and that's what will be set as our foreign key. So if we go back here, I create my new product specifying computer equipment. And I go back to my main store. You can see that the only product that I have not yet given a category is the used t-shirt, but we have the Ruby shoes, which is the uh, clothing category, old banana, which is food, and then this new uh, solid state hard drive, which is listed as computer equipment. Uh, we could now do lots of interesting things with the fact that we have a category. We could make a action where we list all of the products within a particular category. So we might want to make um, an action similar to uh, the one to show individual products. When we show individual products, we do like slash store slash some product ID. Uh, maybe we make one that's like store category and then some category ID, and that would only show the particular products in that category. And on the home page, we could have a listing of all the categories with links to the individual category pages. So there's lots we can do. Um, I won't implement any of that for us today, but um, I think we've done enough work. We now have a products table and a categories table. Uh, they are associated with each other by way of a foreign key and also by way of the fact that I've added the, the belongs to and has many within the models. Uh, the one important step as well when dealing with the models is because we added our foreign key later in the game, we had to change the adder accessibles such that this category ID was in there. If that had not been done, if I had simply added my foreign key but not modified this adder accessible statement, when I try to create a new product or even edit an existing product, so if I go to my products, and let's say I wanted to now put that use t-shirt into a category, everything would look like it was going to work. I could say, okay, yeah, that's clothing, update but I would get an error saying can't mass design protected attributes category ID. And so this is Rails trying to do some security protection for what's called a mass assignment exploit. And we need to sort of whitelist that column here saying it's okay for the, the web to be able to have access and modify the category ID. So now if I was to go back and make that submission And maybe one very last final change we could make. Uh, we have all of these 
um, the partial being used here is displaying the category. But when we are in our back end for individual products, we're not currently uh, using that partial. And so notice here we have yet another way of displaying products and it doesn't yet include our category. So we might want to go to the app views products show and instead of having this big description of what it is to be a product, we could replace that with a render statement to render the individual product. And now even in our back end, after we have added or edited a particular product, we would see a product representation that looked the same as what our customers would see on the front end, including the category drying up our code a little bit more. All right, that's all I wanted to show you for today. We covered quite a bit. Uh, the main takeaways here are the partial that we created that was directly associated with a member of an active record um, object type. So we created a partial for uh, a product and we put it in the products folder of the app views uh, section of our website. And then the other big thing we did is we used a migration to add a new column to our products table. And then we sort of reworked some elements of our site to make our backend aware of that association. Now, if you're working with active admin for your project and you work um, at building your models and associations up front, so you go and generate all your models, uh, they include all the foreign keys, and then you go and in edit your models to ha add all the has many and belongs to. If you do all that work up front and then you use active admin, it will automatically pick up those associations for you and it will automatically do things like give you drop down menus for your foreign key associations. So you don't actually have to do that extra work if you're working with active admin. Okay, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching the screencast.